here on a Friday afternoon. A little chilly today here, Chris, and it's uh, raining out here in South Carolina. And uh, I decided to come in the kitchen today because my office is, is kind of dark and uh, I didn't feel like really blasting a bunch of lights and I felt like sitting at the kitchen table today. Uh, and uh, I've got guests here today. Jimmy the Shark is here. Uh, who, those of you that know who he is, he's a good friend of mine, grew up with him. Uh, he's visiting for the for the holidays and his wife. And uh, we've got a, a vinyl record party tonight, Chris. Uh -oh. We're actually heading over to my neighbors and we're doing a vinyl record party where we're going to spin some some vinyl. And uh, so we're going to be doing that tonight. But uh, yeah, I just figured I would jump on uh, here on this uh, Facebook Live and we'll talk a little bit about uh, what's been happening in, uh, in the new brand. Um, talk a little bit about uh, th this conversation that I generally have when someone is asking about product research. And I really wanted to dig into that. I know you and I jumped on YouTube yesterday, did a little bit of a YouTube live. And uh, I wanted to kind of talk about that again um, and and really just try to clear up, I guess, the way that you're looking at products and, you know, not just looking at, you know, the, the I guess the tool that everyone else is looking at. The tools are great, but we got to we got to think about it a little bit differently. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much what I want to do. Uh, let, let me just let me just say, anyone that is tuning in, I always should remember to do this, Chris. Anyone that's tuning in right now, a couple of things. Number one, share this, like it, comment. Let us know if you have any questions. Um, also, just let us know that you can hear us, that you can see us, and uh, let us know how things are going in your world. Uh, you know, let us know and. Uh, if you see anybody moving behind me, there's probably guests or my daughter will be coming home from school. So this is going to be totally loose. So I don't know what's going to happen behind me. So keep an eye on back there. We'll see what happens. Aaron Jennings is in the house. He says, hey, guys, hope you all are well. Brandon says, Burr and Scott, you know, you're complaining about cold and rainy yeah. in South Carolina. I have two inches of snow in my backyard. Whoa. Well, okay. I did this morning. It's probably gone now because it's about 50 degrees. But wow. uh was out driving around last night and went, is that a flurry? And came back down the hill towards where I live. And just the change in elevation was enough that, that it had stopped snowing by the time I got home. Wow. And I look out about 1130 and there is two, two and a half inches of big, fluffy, perfect snowman sledding snowball fight snow That's in my backyard. And I'm going to tell crazy. you, people in central Texas do not know how to handle snow. Wow. It's like... Do you remember the blizzard of 93? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how, like, they still share, like, photos of, like, mm -hmm. nothing on the grocery store shelves and, like, just a single wire, right? Yeah, like, yeah, left yeah. Like, the yeah. shelves and the bread and the milk. Yeah. That's what everybody down here is acting like. I'm like, guys, <laughs> it's, like, it's melted. It's 1 o'clock and it's melted. And it's funny. And the, the schools are closed. I'm like, <laughs> you know. It's funny. My, my wife went to the market to get a few things for my daughter's birthday party. Actually, my daughter's 10. I uh, just turned 10, but we're having a party this weekend. And she went in to get stuff and it was mobbed. And uh, she's like, why is it so mobbed? And people are all panicking because they thought that they were going to have a mixy, uh, you know, a, a mix uh, winter. A little uh, bit of slush. Yeah, a little slush. And I'm like, really? Like, people are like clearing the shelves for that? Anyway. Um, <laughs> all right. Let's, uh, let's get to business here. Uh, I, I sent an email out today to really kind of uh, get people ready just to – to stop complaining, to, to kind of get out there and just, just do it, right? Like in 2018, we got to get out there and we got to make a decision like we're either going to do this thing or we're not, right? And I really want just people to understand that, you know, we can keep putting it off. We can keep saying, ah, we're going to do it or, oh, I, you know, I, I got to wait for this to be just right or I got to wait for, for me to get enough capital to start. Like all of those things, I just want you to start, period. So um, that was what my email was about today. If you guys have not read it, Go look for it. It'll be in your inbox as long as you are subscribed to my email list. And um, yeah, just, I mean, that's the big thing for me right now and really moving into 2018 because if we look at the new brand that we started from scratch eight months ago, we never would be able to share what we're sharing if we hadn't started. And this thing is growing into something pretty pretty awesome. Um, so anyway, um, and I guess right now would probably be a good time too to remind people that uh, have not attended one of our workshops. We just did our last workshop on Tuesday and uh, that'll be the last workshop for 2017. But that workshop is exactly what we talk about for building a brand and, and for, for launching a product on Amazon. People always ask like, Scott, what, what's different now than it was in 2016, 2015? That workshop lays it all out. So theamazingseller.com forward slash workshop.
All right, cool. Let's uh, let's dig in, Chris. Where you want to start? I'm just gonna kick through some comments here really fast, and then we'll jump into those four things, Scott, that we talked about before we jumped on. Ruben says, "Yeah, Central Texas here. We just don't have any idea what to do." Nick Gamble, who's just up up the road a couple hours from me, probably didn't see any of that. He says, "Howdy, guys!" And we got a couple great questions coming in. And Scott, as we start to work our way through the material, I did want to remind everybody that we do have some things that we got, we come prepared with every week, guys, that we want to talk to you about. But we also like to save some time for Q and A. So if you have any questions about selling on Amazon, about e-commerce, about building a brand, building a list, anything that's on your mind right now that you want us to tackle, drop those in the comments, and we'll get to them when we when we start to dive into that stuff. So Scott, you did mention a couple minutes ago we we jumped on YouTube Live yesterday and we did something really quick because it was something that was kind of on our minds. Yeah. We talked about like four different ways to make sure that your next product doesn't flop, right? And it's, yeah. it's not just using the most recent tools. So do you want to dive into that really fast? Sure. Uh, well, I am prepared, but I'm not prepared. I know the four, but I'm going to go ahead and try to remember those off the top of my head. But number one, the very first thing that I, I think that we need to talk about is kind of like when you're thinking about a product, no matter what that is, we used yesterday Fidget Spinner as an example. Because we get the question, would I build an email list in fidget spinners? And the answer is probably not. Could you? Yeah, you could build something in the kid market or you know into toys or something like that. Um, but you're not going to basically do a giveaway for fidget spinners to sell necessarily fidget spinners for the next five years. Right. So the very first thing that I always look at, and it was funny because, you know, my buddies here from from uh, Arizona, Jimmy, and we, you know, we talked last night business as usual a little bit here and there. It's just stuff that I like to talk about. But just, you know, we're talking about like a few ideas that he has right now. So we kind of started going through that entire process. And the process was the very first part of it was and it's just what I'm telling you guys right now. Is there a market right now, a community or group of people that you could go out there and see that there's a conversation that is being discussed that is related to your product that you want to launch? Or is there a community that can help you create that product or discover that product? If the answer is yes, then okay, let's move on, right? So that's kind of what I think you need to, need to ask yourself is like questions like that. Again, if you're selling a fishing pole, then we know that there's a fishing market that we got to find. If there's a fishing market, is there a specific fishing market that we're going to go into? Is that going to be bass fishing? Is it going to be fly fishing? So you have to kind of niche down. That's what we call niching down or niching down, depending on where you come from. Uh, so that's the very first thing that I kind of want to highlight here is just understand when you're, you know, when you're getting into this, ask yourself that question. Okay, are there markets out there right now or, or communities out there in the market that you want to go into? Um, and, uh, and is there a way that you can connect with those people or maybe get those people to raise their hand and let you know that they're interested in that stuff? Does that make sense, Chris? It does. And kind of the way, Scott, that I've been thinking about this since you and I started talking about it yesterday is one, is there that community? Like, are there groups of people who actually care about it? But right. kind of the side benefit of that is, is this something that people are going to use more than once? Or is it something that in the next, let's say, three, four or five years that they would buy from me again, even if it's not like a monthly thing, right? Like, if it, even if it's not like a supplement, would they potentially buy it from me again? Or would they tell their friend to get that specific one? And the example we used yesterday was like a pug, right? Because you have you have Brody, who's a puggle, and there's obviously lots of groups dedicated to pugs. So if you had a product for a pug, pug owners expect to have their pugs for 10, 15 years. It's not something that they're going to use once and kind of throw away, exactly. right? So if it's something that, that works well for them and it works, they're going to continue to use it over the lifetime of their dog, even if it's a collar, right? And it's not like dog food, which they would buy from you every couple of weeks. If the collar finally wears down in three or four years, they're going to have the same dog and they're actually going to come back to you because you're pugcollars.com or whatever your brand is. Right, right. right. And so that kind of thing really helps to, to niche down on that. Yeah. Yeah. So again, just to kind of highlight that before we move on is really, you know, thinking about the product and does it serve a market? So that's like number one. Um, number two, uh, and Chris, feel free to fill in the blanks if I go out of order here. Um, but number two is, can I, can I build an email list in that group? Can I, uh, or, or for those people, can I come up with something that will get those people to raise their hand? Okay. So that's the next question. So, all right. So if I'm selling in the fishing space and I'm going to go into the bass fishing space, can I put together something that will get their attention? So they'll raise their hand. And then now I know that those people are interested. 
So if the answer is yes, then I would say, okay, check. We've got that. We've got that taken care of. So that would be the next thing for me. So number one, establishing first, if there's a community, if there's a, if there's, you know, a group or if there's a, a forum, whatever, right? Going back in the day, right? If there's something where people are gathering and talking about this, like in pugs, we found pug groups on, you know, Facebook, a hundred thousand people in it, right? Talking about uh, pugs. So that there would match that. So I'd say, okay, check that does. Now let's move on. Can I build an email list in that? Yeah, I'll come up with this pug, uh, you know, this giveaway of all of these different, you know, uh, a jacket for the pugs, bo a pug booties, uh, a leash, uh, maybe, uh, maybe even a supplement, uh, you know, like, so I would have all these things that would a pug owner would be like, yeah, I want to win that. I want that. Right. So they raised their hand. Okay. So that's one and two. Okay. What do you want to talk about there, Chris, on that? And and Scott, I, I don't know what order necessarily those four are in for you, but number two really plays into number three, at least in my mind, which is, is there other stuff that I can sell them? Yep. Right? Yep. If there is a group, that's a huge check for us. Mm -hmm. Okay. If there's an obvious way that we can tap into that group and put them on our list, that's great. We're going to use that for our first product. Right. But as we start to develop that product, there's going to be other things. So does there immediately com come to mind two, three, or four other things that you yep. can sell to that same group of people. Because if they're only going to buy one thing, that's okay, but mm -hmm. it's not necessarily ideal over the long term. So that third one for me is, is there other things that kind of come to mind? And Absolutely. those two things play really well together. And we're seeing that in the new brand that we launched because every time we launch a product, we can reach out to that email list and we sell 50, 100, 150 mm -hmm. in the first few days that it's there just by having that list. Yeah. And it gives us an easy way to put those new things that we're launching in front of people and get those traffic and sales up front. Mm -hmm. so, Scott, is that number three in your book too? Or was that kind of further down the list? No, no, that 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 was totally it. Oh, look at Dom's coming in here. Wow, <laughs> nice of you to show up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> What did you? Right, I had a, what did you not get the memo? Uh, no, <laughs> I got I got a, savings. It's right. Yeah, I'm an hour behind. No, I had a client come in, and uh, I can't. You know, they obviously don't know what I'm doing online. I can't just say I got a I got a podcast to be on. So they're like, okay, we'll take this. There's a big order, so we'll take this and this uh, and this. Right, like, right, man, we'll you, you're making money. You're making money. Yeah. Um. Okay. Well, Dom, we're, what we're doing? We're just covering a couple of things here right now about um. Uh, you know, figuring out a way to establish if a, if a product is, is worth going into without, you know, worrying about it flopping. So we're just going to finish that off and then we'll, we'll bring you in. Um, but yeah, Chris, I mean, you know, the order, it doesn't really matter 100% of the exact order, but understanding those four, those four parts. Um, so the other thing, like you said, Chris, are, are, there, are there three or four products that I can think of right off the bat without even trying? Right. So for I go, I go back into the fishing. Right. So I go, OK, I got fishing lures. I got a fishing net. I got a fishing tackle box. I got a fishing pole. I got a fishing reel. Uh, you know, that's just off the top of my head. Right. So I'm like, boom, 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 boom. Now we can dry. We, we can drill into just bait. We can drill into just lures and we can go off into a whole bunch of different directions there if we want to. Um, so automatically I'm, I'm getting all of these all of these different ideas. OK, from that. So that's a that's a, a win for me. Um, so number one. Is there a community out there of people that are passionate about it or that are, you know, talking amongst themselves? Yes. Number two, um, can I build an email list in, in that market? Um, and if I can, then cool. Um, are there products that I can think of off the bat that, you know, I could, I could launch um, or that I could think about that would even pertain to those people? So that's number three. And what do you have for number four? Number four... I Honestly, I don't remember what number four is. Oh. So. <laughs> I'm trying to, because I mean, the other one is other products, but also variations. Right. Almost. And that's, and that's kind of what I was, what I was going into. If, okay. If so you that can, is, that is number it, four for you. It's kind well. of a spin. Yeah. It's kind of a spin off of if I can think of three or four products um, like that, then the next thing would be like, let me try to figure out, you know, the one product, but then figure out the other products that I could stack onto that. So again, it does come into launching more than just one product. Can I sell more than just one product? Right. And, and variations are, in my opinion, one of the easiest ways to kind of diversify. And we dove into this a little bit last week, but if you can add a color or a size or a, a quantity variation to your listing. Yeah. It's a really easy way to put roots down 
with someone who might not be interested in the red one, but they also would really like the blue one, right? So you're kind of expanding that product line. Sean says, pretty much the message is to sell consumables. And I'm going to go ahead and disagree with you. No, no. It's not to sell consumables. It's to find things that people are passionate about. We don't right? have it consumables in the new brand. Mess. We don't have consumable. Well, we have well, one we, product. We have, that is, we have but, three SKUs that are, but well, one product with three variations. Yeah, but, but it's not even, it's to me, it's that that's even one that we're probably going to phase out. It's not, it doesn't have legs right now for us. And, and we, I, I think down the line we might, but not right now, but no, ours are pretty much, you might as well just say we don't have consumables right now. And that's to me, like technically everything is consumable, right? Like yeah. a car is technically a consumable. It just takes eight years before you buy a new one. But what we're talking about are, are products that are complementary and related, right? So they don't necessarily have to completely complement one another, right. but they do have to, to appeal to the same group of people. So mm -hmm. if you sell a garlic press, you could still kind of get away with selling a cutting board and you could also sell salt, <laughs> right? Like salt in that case would be the consumable, but you wouldn't have to do that. You're just looking for additional products that would appeal to the same market. And if you can think of a couple of those, then it works really, really well. Yep. Yeah. Dom, let me ask you, we'll get you in on this, on this conversation. Uh, let's not talk about the open brand. Let's talk about your main brands. Like when you were launching those, what was that process for you to figure out the next product to, to add to that product line? Yeah. Well, when we did the research, we basically... My first brand was niche, I guess, like real condensed. You know, I knew I could release a few products. We just concentrated on the first product. So that took us forever, like six months. And then we just kind of launched different variations of that and accessories to go with it. So uh, we knew that that was going to be the focus. So I, I guess what I'm saying is like we didn't, uh, uh, what, we didn't do fashion stuff and do t-shirts and fedoras and shoes mm -hmm. we just basically did we picked shoes and we did different color shoes and different laces and that type of stuff right okay. so okay so it's, not, it's, it's, so, still, so it's really, still related yeah it's yeah. it's related now back then you could do it either way you could say look i'm gonna get into i'm, I'm gonna get into electronics and i'm gonna do 10 different electronic stuff mm -hmm. toys or whatever uh, you know we're now you know it's changed a bit but that's how we did it now for uh, one of my brands, I've partnered up. So that was another niche thing. Somebody has expertise in that. We just kind of broadened it and mm -hmm. took it to the Amazon marketplace instead of sitting in a brick and mortar and trying to do shows, you know, making 500 bucks when you could do that and, you know, in a day online. Mm -hmm. And then uh, one of our, the newest brand before the open brand was basically a plethora of stuff, nothing specific except for that. It, it you know, it, it was, I don't know how to explain it. It was, it was specific genres, of kind of the same thing, same item, but for different genres, like for different categories. Okay. So we had a huge, like a huge uptaking. Like we could pick from different categories all over the place, kind of do it. But it was all the same. Not like the open brand where I pick this, I pick that, and it's totally different. Mm -hmm. These were kind of related stuff, but for different people or, or different to uh, different, uh, you know, times of the year or whatever, like that, that, that type okay. of stuff. So, okay. That makes so sense. That's, yeah, so that was a lot easier to pick because we could just get, okay, you know what? This is all for men. This is all for women. This okay. is all for kids. This is all for the elderly. This is all for people that live in the north. This is for all the people that live in the south. So you know what I'm saying? Like so that, you're, that's you're, what you're, you're narrowing the focus, but for like a demographic or for a exactly. type of person. I exactly. I now, so our first brand was basically specific. So like I said, we took a shoe or a tire. We just did four different tires, mm -hmm. you know, radio tire all season. Where, and then we, you know, we did this inch tire, that big inch tire. Then we did rims to go with it. Like we didn't, we didn't go all over the place. So I, again, uh, the problem now is to try and find four or five products that are going to go together that you're going to be successful. You might be able to launch the first one, but by the time you get to the second or the third, you're going to get crushed because you didn't launch it. You don't have enough capital to do it all at once. And then it's going to be saturated. So, I mean, you know, when I first started this, I mean, here, here's something we used to do. You know, we used to do some stuff in the in the in the travel space, right? That was like one of my brands, my second brand. Well, one of my second brands, and we got out of it. We totally liquidated all that stuff because now that, you know, we're like, okay, let's do this, let's do this, and then we thought, okay, let's get into these e-bag things. These these you know those roll. Remember you talked about you roll them up and they you know you get four cube bags or whatever they're called. Yeah. yeah. But when we got to those, it was so saturated that was going to be our main 
that we just couldn't do it. And then we're, we're going to go, okay, we're going to do luggage tags. That's saturated. So we're just like, okay, let's just give up. Like, you know, we're already two, three SKUs in. Why keep going when everything that we're going to launch is going to get crushed? So we just sold that part off and started another brand. So Scott, that was a question that I was going to ask yeah. you because I, I actually don't feel that way in, in the new brand. And if you can think of those four or five products kind of off the bat, to you, does it matter up front if you think you can be competitive there or even if it meets necessarily the 10 by 10 by one criteria in terms of things yeah. like reviews and, and those kinds of things? Do, if you're taking the time and the effort to build a brand, Scott, do you think that that, that that plays as much of a role if you're building the list and you're getting involved in those communities? The, the difference though, guys, with your open, with your brand and even with the open brand stuff is that you guys are in a, a you know, in a, a popular market, but it's not, it wasn't there 20 years ago, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, mm -hmm. like luggage and package and toy. They, they were there 30 years ago, 40 years. Like it's always been around. You know what I'm saying? So it's yeah. not, it, it's not like, you know, you're, if I was doing, you know, accessories, like, like, you know, one of your, one of your podcasts that you did, uh, you know, accessories for, uh, you know, Dyson, like Dyson's only been around for 15 years or 20 years. Mm -hmm. So there's still a new market. It's not oversaturated right. or, right. so it depends if you want to build a brand on it. Yeah, it, it's good. You know, again, you just have to, it, I think it's the same criteria though, Chris, you still have to check the depth on it. And do you really have time to, to research, you know, 10 items deep, you know, cause that's the way you're going to go. You know, or you're gonna just, you're gonna do like you've done. Yeah, you know what? We released two, three, eight products out of the eight. Three are really duds. You know, okay. Well, then we'll move on to the other one because we've already have six solid, and that's all you can do it, and that's all I would do. Well, I, I think that's I think that is the name of the game, though. And we're a little off topic, but what we're talking about, but but it kind of relates because I think in order to get in order to get yourself ahead, you have to launch more products, and you have to be able to try to get the product to market first or with your spin on it first before other people will start to come in and then just mm -hmm. keep moving on. And that's, again, that's what J J uh, Mike Jackness has been saying, um, yep. you know, who's been, who's, you know, built a few different brands that are pretty successful is like, you know, you want to go out there and be first to market and launch yep. a bunch of SKUs. Our good, our good friend, I know Nick's on here, but his brother John had said that on one of the uh, interviews that I did uh, or actually he submitted, he submitted to us about like what would be something you would do differently now or what did you learn since you've launched and he's like to just not wait around and just try to be first to market with something yeah, yeah. or the first one to put the spin on it with the bag or the clip or whatever right yeah, yeah it's yeah, like yeah. to try to get ahead that way and, and stop i think so many people are trying to find the one product and then just trying to take that one product and make it the winner and if it's not a winner, then they, they they still marry it and they still try to make it work and make it work. I think you got to go with less item or a less amount to start with and just get it to market to test it before you go with 3,000 units. You know, that's that's what I I think. mean, I, I even find now, again, the old model, you know, we always talk about making your product better and upgrading it. And I even find that's kind of obsolete now too because we've actually gone back and – demodified some of our products does that make any sense so like we would add this we would give this and then i would add to our cost and we weren't making any more money so we got rid of it and we're just selling just as many and we'd save 65 cents a unit mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. but we built the market right so right, people right. would keep coming to us so right. you know again i don't know if that's something you want to you might not want to do but you know sometimes if you overthink it too you know like you yeah. said you want to add this to it you want to add that to it you know mm -hmm. you want to have 55 variations of the same thing you're like right. okay you know, like don't go overboard. Just again, it all boils down to the, I mean, I guess I read your email. It's the same thing. It doesn't really matter what your product is. If you don't release one, if you right. don't even try it, like, right. you know, like it's, you know, and, and if you're lucky enough to, to hit a product that sells well, then you can go with that. Or, you know, I mean, here's, everyone tries to find a space. Here, here's something I just said this morning to our good friend, Jimmy the shark, which yeah. He's he's not around. I don't think he must. No, be, no, I, I heard he. I heard, he I must heard be hiding out. Hey, sure. Just no, <laughs> just texted me. He says, "Are you supposed to be on the show?" Um. So you know, I I had a conversation with him, and you know, we we were talking a little bit about you, know, you and I were talking privately about it a little bit and stuff. And he's a good friend of mine. He works with NTAS a little bit, and he works in another brand of mine. Um. And you know, I, I, he's, he wants to do something with his, with his wife and, you know, and he, and she's got an idea of what she wants to do and stuff. So we're coming up with a plan of what they're going to do. And I may even share that plan here, Chris, I think I might even want to just maybe hop on and we can just kind of just 
kind of like brainstorm different things because that's what I've been doing and, and I'm kind of excited about all the yeah. different components. But I said to him, I go, here's what you need to do because he's like, you know, I'm just not really sure that I'm passionate about it or I'm really not sure that that's the thing. I want to go and do this because I really like that. I go, well, here's what you got to do. Number one, you can do the thing that you love to do and just understand that you're probably not going to, it's not going to really amount to much right now. Okay. Maybe you're going into a space that's really competitive. You don't even know what you're going to do in that space. But with what, you know, like with, with the one thing that his wife wants to do, there, there's really good potential there. Okay. And so I'm like, so what you got to do is you got to immerse yourself in the process. All you need to do is fall in love with the process. Like I'm not excited about what your wife's selling, but I'm excited about the process of creating these things and plugging these pieces in and seeing what happens. That's what fires me up is plugging these things in to any business and then seeing what happens and then you readjust. You know what I mean? Like you plug something in and, and it doesn't work or you plug something in and you're like, I'm not really sure if that's gonna work. And, oh, I plugged that in, look what happened, holy crap. But if you don't plug anything in, you're never gonna be able to see what happens. So to me, and that's what I said to him, I go, just right now, fall in love with the process. Because if you fall in love with the process, you're gonna learn and then you're gonna know, oh, wait a minute here, three months from now, you just, you got approached by someone or you met someone at a party and they're into this thing and you're into this thing and you guys wanna partner now, you understand the process. That's it. Like understand the process and answer your phone when it rings. As Tom, as Tom's uh, muting down his mic. And I think Scott, I think that's something a lot of people Dom, get. turn off your phone. Uh, Dom. Uh, oh, I think that's Dom, something a lot Dom, of people turn, get caught turn, up turn in. off the phone. When they're when they're starting this specifically, Scott, it's like I need this is the thing that I'm going to do forever is the mindset, right? right? And you and I have talked in the past about how things pivot and things change. And that's why we grow our businesses the way that we do. And that's why we say we, we are in it for the long term because we are. Maybe two years from now, Amazon isn't the place to launch products, but we're still going to be launching products because we're in love with the process and we've seen what it can do. If Amazon went away tomorrow, we would still be able to figure out how to do this thing. You're figuring out and Google, if, you're figuring out that stuff, right? We've figured out other things where the traffic is. And if if you know something else comes up and you and I start another brand and that you know that turns into the thing that's our passion because let's be honest we aren't super passionate about the new brand it's cool we enjoy it we like the money that's coming in but it's not necessarily like what we would consider to be our life's work right mm -hmm. but it pays the bills and it can bankroll that other stuff but if you learn the skills through this through the thing that's making you money that's important and everybody every time we do a workshop Scott we get the question like what if I'm not passionate about it? You said Jimmy asked it the other day. That's what you have to determine. If you know what you're passionate about right now, like you know that that's the thing, then go find a product in that space. If you don't, then by all means, launch this thing, fake it till you make it, right? With, with the passion part of it. Yeah. Do the marketing, yeah. do the business right. And then when you have the opportunity to dive in on something that you truly are passionate about, that you want to be the face of, that you want to carry with you for the long term, yeah. then you have that opportunity, not just from a skill set perspective, but potentially from a capital perspective and all of those things as well. You're in a better position to do that when you're ready for it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you know what that is right now, by all means, go for it. But if not, if you need to pay those bills, if you need to do the other stuff, if you need to learn the skills and you're afraid to fail, then fail with the thing that you don't care that much about, yeah. <laughs> but put in the good faith effort to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't think you need, to be honest, I mean, the passion thing is good, and we've talked about it. I've heard lots of people talk about it. Sometimes that gets in the way, too, because, you know, mm -hmm. you, you're passionate about it, and you basically do it, you, you, whatever you're into. That's the, whether you're, you're passionate about fly fishing or, like you said, or skiing, like you're into that, then you basically take what you've learned or what you're into, and you try to translate that into Amazon products, you know, Again, it's the same criteria that we get when we purchase stuff for my team or, you know, even to my wife was like, you know, don't get involved with it. Just look at the price point, what we can flip it for and move on. Do you know what I'm saying? Like once you have a successful, you can move on to the next thing. There's a lot of people that are passionate about their 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 stuff and they're still successful. Now, once you're successful with that, then you can do something passionate. So, you know, I look at it this way. I'm passionate to you know, about uh, the money that's coming in and uh, the lifestyle that I can live and the time I can spend with my kids, the time that I can come down and, and spend time with you guys. That's my passion. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not, the products are relevant to me. It, it could be apples and oranges. I, I get it. I mean, if you're into something that's, you know, 
more personal than than I you know I, I fully understand it. But but let me let me share share this with you. Okay, so let's go back to you know, and I always kind of go back to my story, but that's kind of what I I can kind of share. But like let let's just go. Okay, my construction days. From there, I didn't want to do that forever. So me and my wife started a photography business. The photography business wasn't my passion. It was my wife's passion, if we want to be honest, right? I learned, I learned the tech side of things. I learned the marketing end of things, and I drove the business that way. That was my skill set. That stuff taught me what I'm doing today, okay? So through that process, I was not passionate. Now, I, I did learn to be more passionate because I enjoyed the kids that we were that we were you know taking photographs of we were making we were creating memories that were lasting forever for people that was a good thing it felt awesome but it wasn't my I didn't wake up and get like super excited about taking pictures Photos. but my <laughs> wife did she would she would get like a high of doing infant photography like like if there was a newborn coming in only like literally like seven days old, my wife would get like the night before she was all excited and she kept planning. And then, you know, we literally, we were doing a newborn, you know, fresh. And then from there you were, you were photographing this child for the next seven, eight years. And just, you're watching them grow. That was the passion of hers. And it was cool. And I thought it was cool, but it wasn't like, you know, me learning my guitar and playing my guitar. Like that's a bigger passion for me. Right. But I didn't turn that into something. I just enjoy doing it. So I'm not monetizing that. But even now, fast forward, you know, the podcast and stuff. I didn't start that initially to make money. Is it generating revenue now? Yes, but it's a passion of mine to help people, period. Building businesses is something that is, I'm not passionate about necessarily the the business that we're building maybe. I mean, in some cases it can be, but for me, it's more of the process. And it's about taking what I've learned and plugging it in and seeing, you know, the, the people like, like Aaron that, that we met out there and we did the hot seat with, seeing their potential in a brand and then kind of like, pointing out all these different things and then having them plug it in. That's exciting to me. Like that's, that's rewarding. And it's, that's where I get fired up. So it's like, you just got to figure out what you can tap into to fire you up enough to get through the process and then learn through that process. And then opportunities are going to happen. Dom, I'm yeah. sure you hear opportunities as you're sitting in on a conversation. You're like, should I even bring it up? Because I don't have any really bandwidth to do anything else, but this person could probably launch this or they could do that. It's like, oh, it's just, it's natural. You're, you're, you're constantly thinking in that mindset because that's what you've been doing for so long. Yeah. I'm like, we're, I'm like the, the, the private Island medium over here, private label medium. So when I see people, I'm like, uh, <laughs> right. is there, is there, do, do you have stuff that you could sell on Amazon? I, I have a scent. <laughs> uh, just want to let you let, let, I just want to come forward that there is a private label product in you that's trying to come out and it's saying that you need to go on Amazon now. Like that's what I do when I see people at like, dinner and stuff. <laughs> the private label meeting. Maybe we should tell me story about your story. Um, uh, so yeah, you know what? I how think, long have you been doing uh, ballet? Ballet, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so no, I mean we all have that. Listen, I mean we have a again, you know, again, not, not, I don't tell everything about all our background, but you know we have an advanced company too that 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 we own, and my wife basically takes care of that, and you know. She does her thing and we help out and we got staff doing it. But I mean, I'm not passionate about it. The last thing I want to do is start bringing, you know, tables and tents and, you know, oh, flowers to wedding and all this type of stuff. And so, but she loves it. That's her thing. Right. And private label was really not her thing. She likes it. You know, she's helped people actually at, you know, that, you know, people that we bring our daughter to school with, or, you know, they'll talk some private label and stuff, but you know, it's not her passion. And I, I help because it's, it's part of the family, right? It's right. a, it's part of the business that we that we built, but I I think you know passion's always great, and I would never knock anybody for going into something. You know, if they were a snowboarder or if they like fishing and they want to release product in that, or you know, the space again. You know, talking about you know the shark and the shark's wife, and I, I mean I know what they're into and stuff like that because my wife spends a lot of money with them on that <laughs> stuff. And, uh, <laughs> so I understand there's definitely a big market. It's probably a little saturated, but they could make it work if they want. If mm -hmm. they could, you know. Tweak some stuff. Again, I can, I don't see the shark being passionate about that. Mm -hmm. But when he gets twenty thousand dollars deposited every two weeks, or you know, or every month, he'll be passionate about it. All right, when he can pay his, you know, and and, and his wife could, uh, you know, stop having to sign in this corporate job and all this type of right. stuff. So that's what I look at. And I think 
people forget they mix passion with with you know with with their knowledge and i think most people that come into this business and i think it's it's something that you're already experienced with like you said you vote you could have came in with carpentry and so you could have sold tools and nick right. right. like that guy that came to your place with that little dishwasher part or whatever right. it was right, right. Yeah, like yeah. that that he did no passion about selling that on amazon but he no. knows the business he's no. he knows everything about it right no. the the problem is it's you know us three we're basically like it's like you know when you see uh, somebody wearing a shirt of themselves with their shirt, and inside that shirt, there's another picture, or, or somebody filming them watching TV, and you see their picture on the TV. You know, it's inside, inside. Like we're yeah, yeah. into private. We're our passion is private label, is right. retail art, is podcasting. So we can't sell anything to do with that stuff because our that's our passion. You know, right. it's you know, right. so it's uh, we got to basically take our experiences and uh, for me, it's just an ideas. It's just I like, come up. And it's a, it's a market. I'm like, why isn't there nobody selling this stuff in here? Right. And the same thing, like you, like you found with the Jeeps and stuff like that. Well, there's oh, nobody yeah. really doing it. And you just, you're not passionate about Jeeps. Right. You just saw a, a, a need into it. So right. I think that that's definitely a key. If you already have some knowledge going into it and you've got a lot of experience, I mean, you, you can take it from the shark tank. Same thing. They had question, first question they asked after they find out how much, how did you get into this? Well, I used to be an R and D developer for, uh, for Nike. Oh, that's how come you have your own, yep. you're already in the space for 20 years. You understand it, you know? So cool. If you can right. do that, that's definitely. Let's, um, Plus. let's open up the floor, Chris. Do we have any questions uh, coming in? Anybody have any questions they want us to answer here while we're live here on a Friday afternoon? We do. We got a good one from Ruben here and there's a couple other ones in the queue. He said, I'm doing Facebook ads to get people to my listing, which is uh, a cool educational toy for kids three to six, which is, great this time of year. My initial oh, yeah. targeting is moms of kids three to six who are into stuff like positive parenting, scholastic learning, educational toys, etc. I'm using a cool 15 second time lapse video of the toy being used. So far, 26 of 29 mothers watch almost 100% of my video. Would your call to action be buy now and link directly to my listing? Or is there something else that you would be doing with this? For me, I would not be linking a Facebook ad directly to my Amazon listing. And the reason is you cannot track conversions there accurately now right. if you're using affiliate links and you're using some tracking and you're our buddy jason you work for a fortune 500 company you're going to have some of the capabilities of doing that i would drive them to a landing page that you own and my suggestion ribbon would probably be to do the list building stuff first even if it's on a shorter run and scott i, I want to get kind of your opinion on this but we've talked about that like 150 200 price point for giveaways works really well for a 30-day window as we roll into christmas mm -hmm. here what are your thoughts on taking his product and maybe something else that's hot and doing like two one week long giveaways just to get people in, yeah. close up that giveaway in seven days. You're not you're not gonna get five thousand e money, but you're probably not gonna get five thousand emails in those seven days. But you're gonna be able to turn that around a lot faster. That would take you, Ruben, to the fifteenth if I can do math, which would give you plenty of time to turn around and do it again if you wanted to push people to Amazon. Even that second time, they should still be able to get the stuff in time for Christmas. So I would probably do that just because one, then you get those email addresses. And somebody asked me earlier. Uh, I think it was in the TIS group that they tagged me and they said, Scott, you know, is it cool to um, just build a Facebook page? Like, should I build the email list or should I build a Facebook page or does it matter? And I want to get your thoughts on that kind of half of that question. Why do you and I stress so much to build the email list versus trying to get likes on a Facebook page? Uh, because you can uh, you can directly message those people and we know that it's going to hit their inbox versus a Facebook fan page. Uh, yes, uh, you know, technically they're going to see your stuff, maybe, but not always. Uh, and when they change the algorithm in Facebook, you don't have any control over that. So that's why what we want to do is we want to be able to control that by sending them an email. And it was funny because just this morning I was talking to you know Jim's wife about this, about understanding the difference and and why the email isn't necessarily just the sale. It's also to drive people to our Facebook or our other social platforms. And then from there, get them to share it and get them to start talking about more of, of the product and stuff. But that's why for us, we want to build the email list because we can control it. We can also track the opens and the clicks and all that stuff. And then we can direct them wherever we want. We can direct them to that content or we can direct them over to an offer. And the, the real impetus behind that is it's an asset that we control and have control over for the long term. And that's kind of what you were getting at. Like with Facebook, I can't necessarily, and, and we've seen it happen two or three times. I might have 10,000 people on a Facebook page, but each post might only get 800 to 2000 people to see it, right? 
Right. And that just means it showed up somewhere in their feed. If they opened an email from me, I know for a fact that they at least opened it and saw it, right? Versus just having it delivered or scrolling past it on Facebook, not really acknowledging it. If they opened it, they, they've indicated some intent and I know that they've at least seen the message, whether they read the entire thing, retained it is a different question. But the other thing is we can take that email list and then do other cool stuff with it, like running Facebook ads, right? So let's just say that Ruben gets Scott, I don't know, 1500 email addresses, right? If he's running it for a week okay. versus 30 days, the last contest we did got us about 5,500. So let's just call it 1500 emails. He can then okay. take those 1500 emails, upload those into Facebook and create a custom yep. audience of people yep. who look like those 1500 people. So you're not just marketing to moms of kids who are two years old and like educational toys. You're marketing to people who look like moms who have two or three year old kids like educational toys and already raised their hand that they're interested in your product. And that's where that becomes really, really powerful. Because then if you drive an ad to your Facebook page or to your email list or to whatever you're doing, it becomes a lot easier to capture those people in. Now, the other thing that you can do with Facebook and Scott, this is something we may want to play around with the next time we do a product launch is Facebook actually does have like a direct coupon code redemption type ad mm -hmm. now where you can go, you can upload single use codes into Facebook via a spreadsheet and they could actually opt in to get a discount directly on the product. So Ruben, if that's what you want to do, like if you don't want to go through the contest, you don't want to do any of that, test that with your audience, use that 15, 30 second ad and have them opt in for, you know, even if it's a 10 or 15% discount, then at least you're capturing that email address. You're giving them the coupon code and then they're going over to Amazon with the coupon code and you can track the coupon redemption with single use code. So you don't have any of the, any of those worries about them just just spreading that out. So I wanted to throw that out there as well. Dustin Scott said, I have put my business card on my product. On my business card is a link to opt in uh, for an ebook. The opt-in rates are pretty awful. Do you have any, any ideas to increase those opt-in rates? So what he's doing is he's, he's directly linking over to an opt-in for, for like a, a PDF or, or e something. Book. Yeah. Like a how-to guide or something like that. Well, uh, it not, there, there's a couple things. Number one is your targeting is your targeting correct? Are you targeting the right people? Um, and then number two, is it really something that people care about? <laughs> I mean, not to sound like, you know, like I'm coming down on you or anything, but you, you got to ask yourself that sometimes you think you know what they want, but it's not really the thing that's going to make them do something. So to me, it's like, you know, if you're trying to get your, if you're trying to get your kid to sleep and you've been up for, uh, you know, a week, because you can't get your baby to sleep uh, for whatever reason, you know, and you have an ebook that's going to show me how in, you know, four simple steps, I'm going to be able to make my kids sleep. Uh, I'm going to download that book, right? So it's kind of like you have to figure out if the thing that you're offering is really that desirable. Does that make sense, Chris? It does. And, and in the case of like something you're linking to from a product insert card, Scott, you can do something like an Amazon gift card or something like that. And those usually work okay, but it's less of a direct offer. So there's, there's less yeah. like intent, which is what you and I would call it, right? In terms of yeah. them wanting to be a long-term customer for us. The thing that tends to work really well there, at least in my head, is what's like the next thing that they need or the next thing that they need yeah. to learn about. Exactly. So if we're selling a garlic press, linking to like how to clean your garlic press that you just bought ebook probably isn't the thing that is going to do that. Cause they're going to be like, Oh, this thing's a pain in the butt to clean. Why do I need a whole ebook on how to clean the thing I just bought? Mm -hmm. But if it was a link to 50 ways to use garlic that you didn't even know, that might be something cause they bought a garlic press in their head. They're saying, I'm going to be using it. I'm going to be using a lot more garlic in my cooking. This is pretty cool. Right. That to me would make a lot more sense mm -hmm. than linking to how to clean your garlic press because they're, they don't care about that. That's not, right. you're, you're putting a concern in their head that wasn't there before. <laughs> and it's not necessarily the thing that they, that they care about for the long term. Yep. Yenny says, just started selling the product on amazon.com. It's the same product I'm selling on .ca. Dom, why aren't the reviews the same on amazon.com as they are on .ca? It's the <laughs> well, same there's no, tra there's no traffic. Right. You know, that's, that's going to be your biggest different. Uh, it's the same ASIN. Yeah. I don't know. I think it, because it's a different consumer, the way the platform works. Uh, again, I've said it many times. We actually don't have one ASIN on a dot CA that's private label out of the hunt, you know, out of the many, many that we have lots of retail arm stuff, but not one ASIN. So I couldn't actually tell you to be honest, but I think it's because of the, just the marketplace. They, the way it's they fluctuate. 
Yeah, well, yeah, because those buyers were in the U.S. that reflect that ASIN, right? The, obviously, the purchase is all kind of uh, entwined. So, yeah, it's a good question to actually, uh, you know, call customer service and ask them. It's a good question. If you find out, you can always let us know. I think I think you're nailing the head there, Dom. It's because it's in a different marketplace. Yeah. The yeah. Canada, U.S., Mexico marketplace is not unified in the same way that that the European one mm -hmm. is. Uh, like you have shared inventory in in the European marketplace, even if you're on like .de and .uk, you can kind of share some inventory across those and sell from those different marketplaces. In the US, you actually yeah. would have to have Canadian inventory to sell on .ca or shit across the border when you sell it. That's right. Um, you have to have it here. So it, it is technically a different listing, even though it's the same ASIN. Yeah. yeah. Nick Gamble says, "Howdy, guys." Nick, I want to know how. Uh, how the rest of your week turned out. He said, you know, he didn't get that Black Friday lightning deal and it was kind of slow, but he said it's blown up this week. So I'm curious if he's still hanging nice. out with us. Sean says, I've got a lightning deal coming up Saturday. I'm expecting to sell 645 units. Does the traffic usually spike and then go back to normal right away? I'm currently selling about 55 units a day or does it stay elevated for a while? And the answer to that is, Scott? It depends. It depends. <laughs> and the reason it depends is because it's going to vary based on how successful that lightning deal is, what you do with that traffic, right? If you go from zero to 645 sales and everybody else in your market's only doing 50, then you're going to rock the search results. You're going to rock the rest of that stuff. And as long as you keep some of those placements and your sales kind of tick up a little bit longer, then you're going to be fine. Typically with lightning deals, you see kind of a spike and then a dip and then another baby spike. It's the same thing with anything that we do like in the email list. Anytime you have a big spike in sales, you're gonna have a little bit of a dip, like a correction in the stock market, right? And then it'll dip back up and then it'll kind of slowly go back down to whatever your normal rate is gonna be. And you can actually see the same thing for most products throughout Q4, right? You have Black Friday, Cyber Monday, and then it kind of dips for a couple of days and then it comes back up maybe you know, to 60, 70% of what you did. And then it settles out to whatever the new normal is going to be for the rest of Q4. And Scott, that's kind of exactly what we've seen in the new brand. You know, we did a couple hundred, what, Black Friday, Cyber Monday was well over 200 units. And then we dipped back down to like 80, 90 for a couple of days. And now we're right around 150 pretty steadily. Uh, I think we did 161 yesterday, something like that. And so, you know, we're not as high as the high was, but we're still higher than we were otherwise. And it's because right. that traffic is still going to be there. So right now it's worth running a lightning deal. If you think your product is going to do well with it, it's going to get you some additional velocity, but I wouldn't expect to continue selling like 645 units a day. If you can and you do, that's amazing. Let us know. Um, but if you clear out through all those in a lightning deal, you're going to see a little bit of a dip and it, it will probably end up a little bit higher than it was. So if you were selling 55 a day, you might end up at 60 or 65 for the next few weeks until we kind of roll out a Q4. Carl says it's because Canadians don't know how to enter their credit card online. Um, <laughs> mine, <laughs> yeah, he says mine are private label. J. Greg Cook says, what's the official start time of Friday's TAS webcast? Since the, the time changed to standard, I haven't been able to find it because you're in Arizona, J. Greg, and you guys don't observe two hours. savings time like the rest of the world. Right. So it's 2 p.m. Eastern usually. Uh, and I think... I don't know. Jimmy's there. What time is it in Arizona, Jimmy? <laughs> it's 12 o'clock. Or is it 11? It's two hours. <laughs> no, it's, it's two hours. 12, but sometimes, sometimes it's three. No, but it's I, two. It's, it's this time of year. I was already corrected that today. So it's noon. So right now for you, Jay Greg, it's going to start at noon on Fridays on average. Um, Scott, did you see any other ones? Okay, we got one here from Brandon. He said, my first PPC campaign has 65,000 impressions, 123 clicks, and zero sales. Any ideas or questions? So, Brandon, my first thought is you're getting a heck of a lot of impressions. That's a great rate of impressions. I don't know what time period that's over, but for getting over 1,000 a day, that's usually pretty good. It looks like your issue is yeah. clicks. It's actually getting people yeah. who see the ad to click on it. So, Scott, what are some things he can do to kind of improve that rate? Well, number one, I think it, you need to look at your copy and see what you are, uh, what you're um, saying that the item is. You may be getting impressions, meaning that you're showing up, but if it's not representing the search, then people might be confused and not click. I think the other thing is, is your images. Um, again, uh, we are visually driven when it comes to products. So I think that you have to ask yourself, you know, is my image 
uh, you know, representing the product as good as it should or that people want. Now, here's the deal. You might want to just change it up. Maybe you change out the image with something else. I know we just did a hot seat for someone inside of, of our class and, you know, their image was very confusing. Like it, if I was looking for this thing, I wouldn't really know that that was what I was looking for because it didn't show me. So if you have a product that, uh, that's one item, let's say, let's say it's a garlic press, don't clutter the picture with a whole bunch of other stuff. Show the garlic press because if I'm searching for a garlic press, I want to see a garlic press in that picture and, and really nothing else. I just want to see that maybe the box with it or something. Um, so I think sometimes you got to simplify and kind of like clean that up, but also make sure that that represents the product very, very visually. The other thing is, Chris, is make sure that your picture uses up as much of the space as you can. Don't have the, the you know, your, your garlic press here and then a whole bunch of blank white. Like if you can bring that thing or angle it at a certain way so it takes up more of the image, you want to do that. You want to bring that all the way out to the edge as much as you can. Um, so I can't stress that enough. I see so many people that do it and they're just, it's like the, the, they've got so much space, but they just, it's in the middle, you know? Um, Brandon says yeah, those are over so. about 10 days. So you're getting 65,000, that's 6,500 impressions a day. Your bid is perfect. Your product is relevant. In my opinion there, it's, it's a matter of fixing yep. your title and potentially, and those photos so that somebody's actually interested yeah. in clicking on it. The other thing that will help with that is, are you price competitive, right? If, if you're advertising a $50 product, Right. And everybody else is right. six bucks that's showing up where you're advertising. That's going to play a role right. into it. That would be kind of the last thing that I would look at. That image is really key. And Scott, we did that hot seat for Andrea. And I wanted to share this with you because I don't know if you saw it inside the TAS group. But on, uh, let's see, on the 5th, which was, what was that, Tuesday? We did that hot seat for yeah. her last Thursday or Friday. She changed the images on Monday. The 5th, she sold 11. Yesterday, she sold 10, Right. She had right. been selling one or two a day for the last month or so. She was converting at 58%, right? Her issue was traffic. And she was getting, I think mm -hmm. she sent us, uh, yeah, she got 42,000 impressions, 102 clicks. So very similar to the situation. That was uh, three days of the ad running, right? So she's getting just as many impressions and basically the same click through rate. And just by changing that image and paying attention to what the other people in the marketplace were doing, making it more appealing, showcasing the product. She was able to kind of flip that around and go from a handful of sales a week to 21 sales in the last two and a half days. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know what she's done today, but just making that change is what made that difference for her. It's not, you know, she's not driving any other trade. She's not doing anything else. That was the change that she made. And that was the improvement that she saw. So that's absolutely where I would start. And Scott, you and I have talked about it in the past and maybe we need to do a, a little YouTube video on this, but there's three different places where you can kind of improve those things. The first hurdle in PPC is getting impressions. If you're getting impressions, awesome. Now what? We need to get clicks. Cool. Mm -hmm. If we're getting hundreds of yep. clicks, then we're not getting sales. What's the issue? The issue is conversion rate. So is it our copy? Is it our reviews? Is it that the product is priced too high? All of those things play a role, but we need to identify where we are. In this case, we're getting a ton of impressions. So we need to move on to how to get more clicks, which a lot of times is going to be fixing that image, changing that title, tweaking some of those kinds of things so that we can bring more traffic to the listing and let the listing do its job. Hey, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to ask Dom a, a quick question here. Um, I, I had a, um, I had a question come through and I used uh, him as an example. I had a question come in and I answered it on the podcast. And the question was this, I launched my product. This is all the information I have, so I can't give you any more, but I'm gonna give you what I have. Um, <laughs> yeah, no so problem. a little bit more information might've, might've made it easier. But I, <laughs> you know, let's say that you know, she has a product, she launched it, and she was getting about nine, eight, eight to nine sales a day for probably around four to, four to five weeks. Okay. And then I think she did, I don't know if it was a lightning deal or some type of deal within Amazon. I, I think it's just a lightning deal or maybe best offer or something. Right. So after that happened, she didn't really get a big spike or nothing. After that happened, she basically fell off the map, like maybe one sale a day. Okay. So her question was obviously, what could have happened? How did I lose it? So my first question, and I'll let you kind of think through it, but my first mm -hmm. question was, what did you do to launch, right? 
how did you launch? Like, did you launch with a list or did you just do a review group uh, thing or did you do pay-per-click? Like, what did you do? Okay, so that was my first question. I didn't have the answer to that, but I, I'll, I'll tell you what I thought in a minute, but I want to hear your initial thoughts. If that happened, what would you think or what would be your troubleshooting exercise to get to, to get some, you know, of what to do to, to kind of fix this thing? Yeah, I mean, I, first I would, the obvious one was, did she run an inventory? That would be the number one thing off because of the sale. But if she didn't do very well with it, then uh, probably not. Uh, I would imagine any of the algorithm would have changed too much. If she sold a lot, of course, right? She would have spiked her her BSR and some of her keywords and stuff. Uh, did she turn PPC back on? Some people forget to turn, they turn it off for these campaigns because we do when we do the daily deals. We turn them off because we don't right. get crushed. And I've had that happen. We forgot it for like a day. I'm like, oh, I think we should put that on because our sales just kind of died. Or, you know, she the demand for her product, you know, she sold through what it was. And then, you know, again, that's I've never heard of anybody that's gone through that situation, especially if you're doing 8 to 10 a day. You have already have a, a bit of a market. You've built your, your clientele as such. Now... The only thing is, is that people had bookmarked her or had it in their cart and didn't buy it that day or did. And now they're like, oh, well, it was fourteen ninety five, and now it's nine ninety five. I'll just wait till it goes back on sale and then buy it then. So do you know what I'm saying? So she sold eight, nine and 10 at regular retail. And then she had the lightning deal and dropped it half price. And then people kind of like, oh, I you know, missed that the opportunity. I'll just wait. So that those could be kind of thing or. She just got caught up in, in, in some strange loop or, you know, PPC type thing, which could happen, some type of algorithm. But that would be my inclination okay. at first. Okay. So here, here's, here, was, here was my advice. And I, I went to your, to your pay-per-click thing. Because here, here's what I said. I go, first off, we, we need to know, number one, will your product still sell if people see it? Mm -hmm. Bottom line, we got to see if people will just buy it. If, they see right. it. if people can't That's see right. it, they can't buy it. So obviously yeah. you're not ranking anymore organically. So either other competitors came in and now you're pushed down in the ranking yep. or your product just maybe it's seasonal or maybe it's not the time of year that people are buying this thing, right? So what I need to do like that is I need to get traffic to it. So how do you get traffic to it? Well, you do what you've told me to do. Bid crazy, get get yourself some bids so you can get traffic to see where you're ranking in paid search. So yeah. the I guess the, the strategy that I told her that I would do is I would set my my budget, my daily budget to 25 or 50 bucks on that campaign. And I would go after the four or five obvious keywords that I know traffic exists. And then I would bid five dollars to start. And I would wait 25 minutes like we did. And I would see yep. where I'm ranking. If I'm ranking yep. in the third spot, then I know that in, it's going to take you know a $5 bid to get in the third spot. Then I'm going to wait to see if I get a click. And if I get a click, then I'm going to see how much I'm paying for that click. So That's once, right. I can get, once I can get traffic back to, you know, back to the product, then I can decide, well, people still aren't buying it. They must not want it. Or my product isn't good, right? But if it's the case of you were already selling eight to 10, but now you're yeah. not, it's probably a traffic issue. So now we got to figure if I can get traffic, will the thing still sell? Yeah, I, I think what so happened there my, is maybe- That was my strategy. Maybe her, this is probably what happened. So her competitor knew, their competitors knew that they were doing a lightning deal and she was selling because her BSR kind of spiked up a little bit, or maybe they saw it by fluke. I mean, there's a lot of ways you could do, especially if she's got 10, 20 competitors, they might've pushed her PPC budget up those days because especially that day, because they know that she was going to get a lot of, a lot of traffic to her, to her price right. point. And then they just left the, her, their PPC up there. Right. And then she never put hers up. So then she, her eight to 10 sales were probably based on PPC. And if that's the case, that's mm -hmm. exactly what happened, right? I mean, it's anytime you launch a new product, you have to PPC the heck out of it. So people will get, is that, if you're never going to be on page 33, nobody's going to see you. So, right. you know, I think that's okay. probably what happened. Again, we don't know the whole story, but okay. eight to 10 a day, no, are they but, organic? Yeah. But, right. you know. Okay. But it, it, it comes back down to troubleshooting, right? If if we're selling, that's great. If we stop selling, where where does that stop? Was it traffic? Mm -hmm. Did my conversion rate drop? Where where was that problem? In this case, it sounds like traffic. If you go, if you go from 10 to zero, take a look at those impressions and then you can start to yeah. diagnose and fix the issue. Exactly. Cool. What else we got, Chris? We got a couple had, more questions. Uh, we got a couple more minutes. 
Yeah, we had two. We had two quick questions. One from Dina, who said, uh, "I used door-to-door -door shipping from China on my first product. Unknowingly, had to deal with customs. Fortunately, it went smooth." My question is, should I chance it again or get a customs broker? My supplier has the best shipping prices I've found. So I wanted to kind of throw this out. You're always going to have to deal with customs. There's always, your product needs to come through customs, period. If you're shipping generally less than, I think it's $2,500, it's not necessarily going to get stopped and inspected every time. But I always count on it going through customs. You're going to have some, some tariffs and some duties on just about everything. I'm sure there's some things out there where you're not paying anything. Right, but it's usually a handful of dollars at the very least. If you're using something like DDP, the shipper, either the manufacturer or the, the shipping company, the freight forwarding company, should be able to handle that entire process for you. If not, take a look at somebody like DHL or FedEx who is able to handle that process for you and then they just send you the invoice. I wouldn't want to deal with it. If you want to keep your current supplier, you want to keep your current shipper, you want to keep all that stuff, then, then find somebody who's a, a good customs broker and just kind of keep them on retainer in case you run into an inspection and a hold and you know, those kinds of things. But otherwise, you shouldn't run into to any issues other than having to pay whatever the, the customs and duties are. Rick Martin wanted to know, do you know the, the Amazon news about Amazon collecting tax for the state of Washington and submitting it to the state of Washington and we don't have anything to do? Yes, it's actually a law. It's not Amazon doing it out of the goodness of their heart. State of Washington <laughs> is going to be collect. Yeah, right, right. State of Washington, as of January 1st, is requiring that Amazon collects and remits. All marketplaces collect and remit for the sellers on those marketplaces. That's only happening in Washington state right now. Um, you shouldn't have mm -hmm. to do anything. You shouldn't have to deal with it. Now, there there are supposedly, I haven't like looked up the actual bills, but there are some of the other states who are a little more what's the word, protective of their sales tax revenue, like California mm -hmm. and Virginia and some of those kinds of New York that are supposedly debating the same kind of thing. They're waiting to see how the rollout in Washington goes before they implement it in their state. So hopefully sales tax will be a little bit more simple here in the future. But for right now, the best solution that I've found is still something like tax jar where they're going to be able to tell you exactly where you, where you owe. And then obviously talking to your accountant and your attorney about where you think you should collect and remit um, because that's going to vary for you based on the seller. Uh, Carl said, I heard a piece of news that they're now sending warnings before banning sellers too. And this is something that cracked me up. I saw a, an article about this this week and I said, you know, what's funny. They've always sent warnings. They have always sent warnings. They said, hey, you're doing this thing. Please stop. And if you ignored it, then they would. Be, no one. I have never seen an account. And I've seen people that are like, oh, I got banned out of the blue. And you ask them and they're like, oh, yeah, I got all these emails from them, but I didn't do anything about it. Basically, they're rolling out. It's like a pre-ban thing that you can fill out to tell them how you're fixing all of the problems if you have issues. Mm -hmm. So you're just it, it's a way for them to kind of consolidate all that into one process. And I think that's pretty cool for people who are worried about getting banned. I think that's uh, because that, that's a question we get every once in a while. It's like, should I even do this Amazon thing? I heard it's really sure. easy to get banned. First, it's really not right. Like it's <laughs> you, you have to really violate terms of service to get banned. Yeah, you got to do something pretty, pretty major. Right. Yeah. And like, yeah. we've gotten some warnings on stuff, you know, for some of the stuff that we did that was kind of light gray and kind of in violations of terms of service from time to time, you know, and a couple people this week got reviews, uh, the review manipulation email again. And I said, you know, that's a, that's a warning, right? Amazon is warning you just that you're doing something incorrectly, whether or not you think you are, Amazon thinks you are. So take a look at what you're doing. Um, but they're, they're definitely trying to improve that process. And I think this is a step in the right direction. Basically, they're giving you, uh, I think it's a form or report that you can fill out now, which Scott, it was kind of like when you got a product suspended for quality, you know, which was automated and they were like, what are the steps you had to like click on a thing and fill out the block. And I was like, what are the steps that you took to make sure this isn't going to happen in the future? It's basically the same thing, right. but for something that's, that's more of like right. a bannable offense versus a delisting of a particular product. Yep. One question here for Dom, and then I think we're ready to go. What are Dom's views on adding wholesale accounts in addition to private label brand rolling into 2018? Or do you recommend focusing just on the open label or private label? Well, I mean, the wholesale thing, it depends what type of wholesale you're doing. You know, if you're finding liquidation wholesale and clearance, stuff like that, like we do, it's different. But if you're doing the traditional uh, drop shipping wholesale, you know, these, you know, these, uh, established uh, wholesalers that you could buy stuff that 
thirty thousand other guys are buying, guys or gals are buying from them, flipping them to make 10, 12 percent. I would avoid it. It's a lot of work. You, know, you can mass. You know, there's there's programs that you could put like ten thousand items on and they'll ship it for you you could buy it but there are some people that we've met actually you know that's even scott has, has taught uh you know and that we've uh, we've worked with even at the at the meetups that they go to wholesalers and get specific products in those niche you know whatever like one specific you know niche and then they have like 150 products it's a good way to start your your business but it's not really i don't consider that private label do you know what i'm saying that just no. Not just taking a product and throwing it on. You're not really building a brand. You're just so again. If you want to do that, it's great. But what happens is that a lot of people are going to do it. They're going to once they see you doing six, you know, success. The the, the wholesaler is going to say, hey, hey, I got somebody that's buying all these SKUs and they're throwing it on Amazon. I mean, you might want to do that, or they'll do it themselves. So that's that's the risk that you take with all that stuff. But again, it's yeah. a good way to start to yeah. get your feet wet. The only way, really wet. the only way that I could see that that being, I guess being able to work is if you had a relationship with the wholesaler that made you an exclusive seller on Amazon and you had something right. in writing. That's the only that's way. Right. You're exclusive. Exactly. It's then not, you could you're do it. doing you could... like retail arm. It's, it's going to be the same. You're just always yeah, that's all basically that, having people that's on all the same is. listing. Yep. It's all just retail arm. Exactly. You're just exactly. Yep. All right. All right. I think that about wraps it up, oh, Scott. There um, was one other thing I know that, that we wanted to talk about or two other things. We had one question. What is the deadline for the amazing seller.com forward slash story? Oh, that is actually, I'm going to be announcing that on Monday. So Monday will be the announcement. So if you have not submitted your um, video yet, I would do it over the weekend. Um, so you're definitely going to want to do that. I actually already started going through them, um, which is going to take me some time. Um, so, uh, but my, uh, my plan is to announce the winners on Monday, um, probably Monday afternoon i'm gonna write an email a quick email on monday and let everyone know who the winners are and then uh also remind you of uh you know a couple of things which i should probably remind everyone right now number one our last workshop of 2017 um we did on tuesday is is uh, still up it'll be up through the weekend so if you want to watch that now would be the time if you want to see the exact steps that we use to to still you know, find and launch products. Um, it's basically the entire roadmap. Um, so that's there for you guys. Um, for those of you that, that uh, have heard that we have a, a class we have now for about two and a half years uh, called the Private Label Classroom, we are open for enrollment, but we are closing the enrollment next Wednesday for the rest of this year. So if anyone is interested in that, you can go to privatelabelclassroom.com. Um, or you can just go to the workshop, theamazingseller.com forward slash workshop and uh, watch that replay. And you'll also see an, uh, there's a, a link there that you can get more information about the class and see exactly if that's the right fit for you. Um, so uh, that's that. Um, the story, yes, we are going to be doing, um, like I said, we're going to be announcing the winner of the two scholarship winners of the class. And that will be on Monday, um, theamazingseller.com forward slash story. Um, is where you would submit that. Um, the other thing is I wanted to uh, remind people and I wanted to ask Dom, I haven't talked to him, is Dom going to be on YouTube tomorrow or is he taking Saturday off? No, we'll uh, we'll be on uh, YouTube doing a hangout tomorrow, guys. Anybody wants to uh, ask some retail arm questions, you know, especially with the holiday season coming up, but we'll be on there for sure. Uh, hopefully we'll, you know, I'll uh, learn a little bit as we go on that process because it was pretty interesting last week. But yeah, we'll be there uh, probably from noon till noon till one, uh, uh, you know. And hopefully, we'll make that a staple. Again, we'll see what the okay. you know what the the viewership is and stuff like that. But yeah, uh, anybody wants to know what we're doing? One kfasttrack dot com. Uh, go there, learn, you know, sign up and uh, get your retail arb uh, knowledge uh, up to date. And you guys can start. Uh, looking for your own stuff to sell online and make some money, especially this time of the year. There's so much product. People are looking to start moving through product liquidating, but I already noticed some of the stores here are already starting to, you know, the inflatables and stuff and the Christmas ornaments are already 50% off. So there's already, uh, you know, ch uh, opportunity to, to make some money for sure. So yeah, I'll be there tomorrow at the hangout uh, starting at noon. Okay. So let me, let me tell people how they can get, get to that hangout. That's going to yeah. be uh, the, the link. There will be the amazing seller.com forward slash YouTube. If you go there, you'll go to the YouTube uh, channel, subscribe to that channel, and then from there, you'll be notified when Dom goes live. 
um, or I go live or Chris goes live. We're going to be we're going to be doing more stuff here on YouTube coming into 2018. So keep an eye out for that. Definitely subscribe to the channel. Um, again, the amazing forward slash YouTube. And that'll take you over to the, the YouTube channel for TAS. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, Dom, uh, yeah, tomorrow I think you're going to do great. Uh, you, you did great on your first run last week. I was pretty impressed. Uh, but uh, I'll be around uh, tomorrow as well to, uh, to make sure that you get things off and running correctly. But uh, I think you're going to do fine. Um, so anyway, yeah, that's that's all I got. Let's um, you know what? Before we go though, because I want to do a thumbnail for this uh, this thing here, so we got to do something creative. What can we do creative right now that would make a nice thumbnail image for Facebook and YouTube? Anybody got any ideas? I'm thinking Three Stooges. I just don't know how we'd pull that off. <laughs> so maybe we j maybe. Tom, I don't see your face when you do that. You want to do uh, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil? Is that... <laughs> <laughs> What's the other one? <laughs> whoop, 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 whoop. Is that the one? All right. Out of all those shots, I should be able to come up with something for a thumbnail. So keep an eye out for the thumbnail that gets selected for this live hangout. Uh, all right. So uh, now that we've had a few laughs, uh, let's uh, let's get out of here. What do you say? Um, all right, guys. Uh, have an awesome, amazing uh, day. I'll see you guys back here. Uh, like I said, uh, hey, thanks, Carrie. Uh, hey, Carrie was at the. I, rem I remember Carrie. Carrie was at the um, the first Denver TAS breakthrough live event and she put together the facebook page so she's That's already awesome. back at it helping us out by putting a link in, in, the, in the comments so thank you so much um all right cool so uh, yeah we'll, we'll see you guys around dom will be on youtube tomorrow so the amazing seller.com forward slash youtube go check that out um and uh we'll be around as well chris and i are going to be hopping on doing some doing some facebook uh, lives and some youtube lives here um randomly we got some cool stuff to share so all right guys that's it that's going to wrap it up take care and as always take action